They are new and don't know who this woman is up here. My name is Jennifer Turner, and I direct the China Environment Forum. This is the beginning of my ninth year doing it. The program's been around for t um, almost, almost 11 years. Um, we, like other projects and programs here at the Wilson Center, we bring together government, NGO, business, and the research community around our topic. Um, the China Environment Forum, I think, is unique in that we focus on one country and one issue writ large, the environment. And we focus also an awful lot on energy issues. And those of you who are regulars to our forum, uh, either here or on the web, might have noticed that once that in the last couple months we've kind of gotten back on the energy bandwagon. Um, I mean, over the la some of it just some, sometimes depends when I can snatch speakers, but but clearly energy is a top issue. I mean, we know that last year some some people believe that China surpassed the U.S. on CO2 emissions. One other fact that a lot of time, not everyone knows though is that last year was also significant in that. <coughs> Between 2000 and 2007, China doubled their coal use, mm -hmm. which was much faster than they had expected to, which can explain a lot of some, some, some of the troubles that Beijing is having in cleaning up its emissions. In fact, because the regions around, you know, south of Beijing, their coal emissions have grown considerably and the winds blow south to north. So, you know, kind of keep that in mind when you're thinking about Beijing's air problems, that some of it is regional and that even though Beijing itself has cleaned up a lot, They've cleaned up a lot over the last 10 years. The surrounding region has kind of nullified some of those advances along with the cars. Um, we had in December, we had representatives from the International Energy Agency and the World Bank who came here to talk to us about what they were seeing in their projects as progressive <coughs> trends, particularly at the provincial level, in doing projects and programs on energy efficiency. And last month we had um, Debbie Seligson from the World Resources Institute who talked about their just launched initiative in, in, in that they're working with local governments and companies to try to help them measure their CO2 and air pollution emissions and to, you know, kind of to help as a motivator to help them lower. And so, you know, that's, that's, that, that, that's one example of, of, of NGOs working with, with China on energy efficiency. In May, we're probably going to have California Energy Commission and the Natural Resources Defense Council come and talk about their partnership between California and Jiangsu province on promoting energy efficiency. It's, it's called a, it's a creating a demand-side management center, but there's, it's not like a bricks and mortar. It's more like initiatives bringing you know, a major U.S. state and a major you know, province in China together and you know it's quite exciting to see you know again the China Environment Forum we often focus a lot on these grassroots trends or bottom up trends next month we're actually screening a film for the Environmental Film Festival on ener on green buildings in China so a you get to bring your popcorn and watch a movie but also we'll have a discussion afterwards in which the panelists will talk about some of the initiatives around China in in trying to promote green buildings and and eco cities so stay tuned for that today though we have a lawyer. <laughs> now, this is not just any lawyer. He's a professor at a university, but he doesn't just wear the professor teacher hat and researcher hat. Like, in, like a lot of um, academics in China, in, in the environmental field in particular, the, he is someone who's also an advisor to, to policy making. Um, the National People's Congress has, has really been opening up, I feel, the forum for, for uh, getting input from academics. And I think overall in China that we are seeing, in, particularly in the last five years, a lot more public participation in environmental decision making. I mean, we, we, we've had meetings like last year on the environmental impact assessment, public participation regulations. And so today he's going to talk about the renewable energy and energy conservation laws that, you know, that he was involved with and, and pointing out some of the weaknesses and strengths of these laws. And, and I also hope that, you know, it might come out more in the Q&A because I'm kind of interested in also talking to him about just even the fact of, of the process itself, you know, that in, about the influence that academics like him actually might have on the process. So with that said, we are a full room, 910. Thank you very much for, for making it way through the slippery slopes to come here. And um, I'd like to um, introduce, um, make sure I get your bio here, Wang Ming Yuan. Um, unfortunately, Ma Junju, who came, was not able to come today. He, he had a bit of a fall yesterday on D.C.'s wonderful icy streets. So um, he sends his regrets, um, and I think that, that Wang is also going to yes. say his comments as well. So he's got double duty today. Um, Wang is an associate professor and executive director at the Center for Environmental, Natural Resources, and Energy Law at Tsinghua University. As I, 
As I noted before, he's been very involved in the advising and, and shaping, I believe, of some of the major environmental and energy laws in China. More of his bio is here. I'm going to stop talking because you came to hear him and not me, right? Right, just not in between your scone bites. Okay, um, I'd like to welcome you. Can we welcome him? Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming to this seminar in this, you know, raining day. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to talk about some, you know, legal issues on the Chinese energy conservation and renewable energy development. Um, I'm also very pleased, uh, you know, uh, to meet some old friends here again and to get to know some new friends. And uh, Jennifer has just mentioned that I'm teaching at Tsinghua University Law School. I'm also, you know, uh, conducting research and advising the central and local governments uh, in the field of environmental and energy laws. Um, for example, you know, currently uh, we are, you know, uh, making every efforts to, you know, pre to be prepared for the Olympic game. Uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges for Beijing is the air quality. So the Beijing municipal government and even the central government is work, working very hard to control the, you know, air pollution, in particular the emissions from the uh, cars. You know, in Beijing, uh, which is a very, very big city, there are currently three many, almost three many private, uh, not only private, you know, almost three many cars. And a thousand, a thousand new per day on the streets. Yes, yes. So, so the air quality is a uh, you know, big headache so, uh, for, for, you know, not only the uh, decision makers, for the, you know, but also for the ordinary people. So uh, today my topic is um, China's efforts and plights in moving towards a low carbon future. Uh, I will focus on the energy conservation and the renewable energy laws. Um, my presentation includes the following four parts. The background, uh, we're, we're general introduction. And the second part is energy conservation law. And the third part is renewable energy law. And the, at, you know, uh, at the last, uh, you know, our simple conclusions. Um, you know, uh, it's still a, a challenge for me to give a lecture in English, but I will try. I would like to try all my best to make myself understood uh, to understand you well. Okay. This so, is beautiful English, isn't it? <laughs> it's beautiful okay. English. Don't worry. Just, we're, you're among friends here. Okay. Great. So you know, uh, I was educated in China. Yes. So I studied my, my English. Right. Okay. Uh, so if I cannot uh, understand you well, I, I will beg your pardon. So now let's come to the background. So, you know, when we talk about the energy conservation and the renewable energy loss uh, in China, we should keep in mind some points. I think the first one is that China is in transition. We should keep in mind that China, you know, you know a, a, a big country with the biggest population, currently is transferring from its traditional model, plan, planned econo economy model to the market-oriented model, uh, transferring from a traditional state with rule of man to a modern state with rule of law. So we could see that you know, currently and in the future, laws are playing more and more important roles in Chinese social, economic, and political life. So this is the first point. 
The second point is that we should uh, see that China today is the second largest greenhouse gases emitter, just next to the United States. But you know, some studies uh, indicate that in the in the in in some time, China will become the number one greenhouse gas emitter. So, you know, this, you know, achievements is not so <laughs> encouraging, but we have to face this challenge. Um, this is the second point. The third point is that, you know, China today, with the acceleration process of urbanization, industrialization, and the increase of residential energy consumption, we could see that the total energy consumption is increasing very, very fast. This is the third point. And the last point is that Chinese special challenges of the energy, low energy, conf, uh, energy efficiency and the co-dominated energy mix. You know, this low energy efficiency and the co-dominated energy mix has resulted in very severe uh, adverse environmental and social effects, in particular the air pollution including the emission of carbon dioxide. So when we you know, keep in mind the above mentioned points in, in our head, mind, so we come to the second part, the energy conservation law in China. Um, first, I will give a very general introduction to the energy conservation law. The current you know, currently in China, in the energy sector, there are four existing laws. The first energy law is the coal industry law. The second one is um, electricity law. And the third one is energy conservation law. And the last one is renewable energy law. So today we touch the last t two ones energy conservation law and renewable energy laws. Except for these four existing laws, the, Ch you know, the Chinese government are working hard to, how to say, uh, um, amend the, some existing laws, such as coal industry law and electricity law, and has just amended the energy conservation law. At the same time, the Chinese government is preparing to pass some new energy laws, such as you know, oil and gas law, nuclear industry law, energy public utility law, and a very general overarching energy law, you know, which cover every energy sector. So that's the general picture of the current legal systems in the field of energy law in China. So now let's come to the energy conservation law. The current energy conservation law um, uh, before this law was amended, uh, was enacted, we could see that in the <coughs> 1990s, Chinese government has, uh, you know, Chinese government established the principle of equal treatment to energy con uh, development and uh, energy conservation, with immediate emphasis on the latter. So this means that, sorry, this means that Chinese government hoped to promote the energy development, at the same time, to conserve the energy to improve the energy efficiency.
Do you need a pen? Oh, a point. Oh. <laughs> we had a laser pen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so this principle is a very important policy, you know, um, policy uh, um, basis for the energy conservation law. So this is one of the background of this law. We could see that in 2006, the National People's Congress passed the 11th five-year plan. This five-year plan for the um, economic, for the national economic and the social development is the um, national guideline for the uh, economic and the social development, which also covers the energy development. This plan fixed as binding targets that the energy consumption per GDP must decline by 2% during the 11th five-year plan. In other words, during the year 2006 through 2010, the energy consumption density must decline by 20%. So this is a great challenge. Another binding target is that the main pollutants, namely the COD and the sulf dioxide must be reduced by 10% during 2006 through 2010. I'll flip you to that. Okay, great. <laughs> so we could see that this, you know, um, targets are very, very uh, challenge, a big challenge for the uh, Chinese government and for the Chinese enterprises. But I have just mentioned, we have to you know, face these problems to improve the energy uh, efficiency, to develop the renewable energy law so that the energy mix could be improved. More green energy could be used. Um, I have just mentioned that China is transferring from the planned economy model to the market-oriented model. We could see that due to the influence of the planned economy model, China mostly relied on the policies rather than laws to regulate energy affairs. But I have mentioned that since are changing, laws including energy laws, are playing more important roles. So we could see that on the November 1st, 1997, the energy conservation law was adopted by the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress. And this law came into effect on January 1st, 1998. So last year, on um, October 28th, the Energy Conservation Law was amended by the Standing Committee of the National Papers Congress, and the amended Energy Conservation Law will come into effect on April the 1st, 2008. So now I would like to um, introduce some basic contents and also give a you know, very simple evaluation on the performance of this energy conservation law, the current energy conservation law. We could see that um, the energy conservation law stresses that energy conservation is a long-term strategy. But I have just mentioned that in the 80s, last century, the Chinese government established the 
the principle of uh, the eco treatment to energy development and energy conservation with immediate emphasis <coughs> on the energy conservation. But this law's you know, uh, statement is not so uh, implicitly uh, you know, s same with that expression. And this energy conservation law requires that the city council, you know, the, the, administra the administration of Chinese government, the city council, and also the people's uh, governments of provinces, autonomous regions, and municipalities, municipalities that uh, are, you know, directly under the central government stressing their efforts in energy conservation. So we could see very easily that the law has, has established the legal obligation for the city council and the governments at the provincial level to conserve, um, at, to uh, stress in the energy conservation. I flipped it already. Okay. So you just you do that. I'll do this. <laughs> we actually we we we, were, we we shortened his PowerPoint and we gave him the longer one. <laughs> so, so, I have like, two different. No, words. they're more or less the same. Just, oh, they're the same. Almost the same. Okay. No, no, it's fine. That's fine. And uh, except for the for the above mentioned, you know, uh, general requirements on the uh, government and the policy declaration, and you know. The, energy, the current energy conservation law has established some key policy uh, directives and tools. Um, the first one is the energy conservation planning system. Uh, another one is energy investment planning system. So you know you, you could see you know planned economy is how to say. The influence of planned economy is so strong here. This is the base of this law. And another one is the evalu evaluation system for rational utilization of energy. Uh, uh, so this system is, uh, you know, uh, uh, is used to evaluate the performance of the uh, energy users, in particular the uh, big. Uh, enterprises. The fourth important system is a system prohibiting new construction of industrial projects with high consumption of energy. Another <coughs> one is energy conservation standard system, the standard system for energy conservation. Another one is energy conservation code system. Evaluation system for outdated and highly energy cons 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 uh, consuming products and equipment. Yes. And also, there are some other uh, you know, tools, such as the certification and the labeling system for energy conservation products. The strict administration system of energy conservation for key <laughs> energy users. And the last one is research and the development funding system for energy conservation technology. So, you know, with these important and uh, policy tools, you know, the Chinese, uh, the, uh, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, hopes hoped that you know uh, this law could uh, uh, make some difference to improve the energy conservation efforts. But uh, the general evaluation is that the strategy of energy conservation as priority and the mandates of this energy conservation law are not being accomplished in their entirety. In other words, this energy conservation law has not worked very well. It has not accomplished its, you know, 
objectives very well. So that's the you know main reason why the Net the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress has decided to amend this energy conservation law. Now, um, I would like to mention some defects of the legislation <coughs> itself. I have just mentioned that this law has declared the energy conservation uh, strategy, has declared that the state council and the uh, local governments of the provincial level, you know, which is quite similar to, to the state mm -hmm. uh, government in the states, right, in the United States. Um, and also, the law has established some you know, policy uh, tools, but it doesn't work well, and uh, um, it has not accomplished its objectives very well. So you know, there are many, many reasons for this. So now I will you know, focus on the shortcomings of the legislation itself. So this is one of the reasons why there is such a failure. Um, so we could see that the energy conservation law fails to deal with the relationship between the market mechanism and the government intervention regarding <coughs> energy conservation. It presents the following issues. You know, I have just mentioned that, you know, um, China is plan currently is transferring, is transferring from the planned economy uh, system to the market uh, economy system. And you could see that the Chinese government decided to transfer, to make this tran you know, uh, transition in, the, in 1992. So when this law was passed in 1997, the planned economy system was still so strong at that time, in particular in the energy sector, <coughs> which was and still is one of the most heavily planned sector in China. So you could see that in China today, the, the, the market-oriented reform is still undergoing in the energy sector. And the first one is the excess, it's excessively narrow scope. You know, uh, the current energy conservation law is mainly designed to cover the manufacturing industries. It, it, its focus is manufacturing industries, enterprises. So generally speaking, there are very few and even non provisions on the energy conservation in the field of construction, transportation, commerce, residential use, government institutions, or public service units. So this very narrow scope cannot suit the current need in China. So you, you, I have just mentioned that, you know, um, in Beijing today, there are about three million cars, but 10 years ago, 500,000 cars. So at that time, the law didn't cover the transportation sector. Maybe, okay, but today, but today transportation is one of the most important energy cons consumers. <laughs> so this narrow scope <coughs> cannot fit the current need. Another situation is that um, the Chinese government decided to develop its real estate, uh, real estate market at the end of uh, I think in 1998. Mm -hmm. In 1998, how to see? 
before 1998, most of the apartments were available, were provided by you know, governments, by universities, by <coughs> enterprises. But there are very few private owned apartments. But you know, after 1998, there you know, you, you know, if you travel to you know China, you could see buildings everywhere, build you know construction works everywhere, and a lot everywhere. of cement plants operating to supply them. So we could yeah. see that the energy consumption in the you know construction field is increasing so fast. But unfortunately, the existing energy conservation law doesn't cover the construction field, and and so on and so forth. So this is the this is one of the big uh, shortages of the energy conservation law itself. And the second one is excessively <coughs> pricing priority provisions. I have mentioned that, you know, in this energy conservation law, the the, the standing committee of the National People's Con Congress has set up generally, in principle, some policy tools, such as the standard, you know, energy conservation standard system, the energy uh, conservation, you know, investment planning system, and so on and so forth. But most of these provisions are very, very simple, are very, very general, pretty simple oriented. So, generally speaking, this where you know pretty simple provisions cannot self you know uh, cannot be <laughs> self executed. Generally speaking, they need you know additional uh, complementary regulations, rules, or even standards to work with these general uh, pretty simple provisions. <coughs> I think you covered some of that. Yes, yes, great. Um, and we could also see that the designs of the legal and of the policy systems are poorly correlated and coordinated. And the targets of energy conservation in this law are not sufficiently clear. So it has set up some objectives of this law, but there are no, you know, specific <coughs> targets. And uh, also, we could see that necessary supporting measures mm -hmm. are weak and even absent. I have just mentioned this law, you know, is very, very short. You know, uh, it has only. Um, Six chapters. Yes, six chapters and uh, fifteen articles. Fifty articles. Were were brief. That's short. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the amended one is is, is much bigger. <laughs> and we could see that under this uh, existing energy conservation law, a new energy conservation mechanism that combines market mechanism, government supervision, and community, community participation has not been set up. So with this existing energy conservation law, you know, um, the most important players are governments, you know, national government and the local governments at the provincial level, and of course some enterprises. But generally speaking, the market mechanism is weak. The government inter intervention and government supervision should be strong, but actually it's not so strong. And also you could see that the civil society participation is, is very weak, mm -hmm. yes, in the energy conservation. That's my job. <laughs> <laughs> Division of labor here. Um, now, you know, so I have just mentioned some points, uh, some uh, 
of the shortcomings, the defects of the uh, energy conservation legislation. Now let's come to the uh, uh, Obstac uh, uh, the, the main barriers, uh, the obstacles uh, that the law faced when it's enforced. And uh, we could see that the first point is the defects in the supervision and administration system and inadequacy in the <coughs> enforcement capacities. You know, um, under this energy conservation law, there is no clear desig uh, designation of a specific enforcement body. This law has not designated its enforcement body should be the planning branch of the state council or the economic branch of the state council. So you can see that when the law was uh, was enacted in 1997, uh, the, 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 branch, the planning branch of the state council, both, of the, uh, both the planning branch and the economic branch of the state council were very strong in the economic development field, the planning commission and the economic and trade commission. The two superpowers, you know, in the economic, you know, field in China. But generally speaking, the Planning Commission should focus on the um, micro uh, economic issues, and the Economic and Trade Commission should focus on the uh, micro mm -hmm. economic issues. But in the in the true life. This division was not was not clear at all. Do they fight? Yeah, Probably. <laughs> they struggle for for power. Who should be responsible for the for the enforcement of, of this energy yeah. conservation law? Okay. So, it, you know, the result is the standing committee, the standing committee of the National People's Congress didn't designate who is the enforcer, who should be the enforcer. Of this law, so it, it cannot, it, it 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 couldn't, you know, decide. And and just to make sure everyone's clear that what you're talking about now is the original 1997 yes, law, but not the today. shortcomings, not, not today. today. <laughs> not okay, today. so we'll make sure that's clear out there. <laughs> not today. So at that time, no no uh, specific enforcement <clears throat> body. Um, and there there was also there was no clear respective scope of duties of the other relevant branches. So we could see that except for the planning committee, a commission, and the economic and trade commission, the two superpowers in the economic field, there, are, there were also other government agencies <coughs> that you know, uh, were responsible for the energy conservation affairs such as the Ministry of Agriculture. At that time, you know, it's responsible for the energy conservation, and in particular, the, the, the um, township and the village enterprises, you know. And the Ministry of Construction. At that time, you know, it should be responsible for the energy conservation in the construction <coughs> field. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of Transportation, and so on and so forth. But for this law, there was no clear scope, the, the, how, how to say, the designation of their you know, duties, their respective duties for these different government agencies. And um, another problem is that the industrial development authorities have been dissolved and consolidated. The energy conservation departments at different levels have been downsized, weakened, or even uh, dismantled. So as you know, this problem has led to you know, a severe efficiency in the government supervisory power. So you know, under the planned economy system, uh, there were different you know, 
industrial sector agencies, such as the uh, agency, you know, for, uh, you know, uh, mm, how to say? What is it in Chinese? Uh, for uh, textiles, industrial, mm -hmm. and uh, for, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, heavy metal industrial and so on. But after the market oriented reform, the Chinese government also, you know, reformed its uh, institutional system. <coughs> so many of these uh, industrial, I have just mentioned this industrial, uh, you know, uh, development agencies have been, you know, uh, dissolved or even be uh, consolidated. So at the, at the national level, there were few, there were, how to say, there are fewer and fewer government agencies that, you know, get involved in the energy conservation affair. But at the local levels, the provincial level and the uh, uh, county level and the district level, many of the agencies that are responsible for the energy conservation affairs have been downsized, weakened, or even been dismantled. So we could see that the energy conservation uh, um, in enforcement force has been you know, weakened very severely. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the price for the, uh, you know, uh, market oriented reform. <laughs> so, and uh, the second, you know, uh, I think the second biggest, uh, you know, barrier for the uh, poor enforcement of the energy conservation law is the weak awareness and poor investment, in particular for local governments. So you could see that with the, you know, um, economic development, the whole society, the whole Chinese society, attaches great importance to the supply and the exploitation of energy. People would like to to how to construct more, you know, uh, power plants, to you know, uh, produce more coal, to produce more electric le electricity and so on. But generally speaking, the whole so society disregards energy conservation and energy efficiency. So the they side, uh, the, the demand side, require uh, you know management for the energy is very, very poor. So this is the situation for the whole society. At the same time, we could see that many governments, organs, in particular the local governments, are aware of the significance of energy conservation. They prefer to, you know, construct you know, big thermal power plants. Uh, today, you know, many, many local governments are, you know, are fighting for, you know, big nuclear power plants projects. But few of them are very, very interested in the energy conservation and energy efficiency and so on. You know, there are many, many underlying elements for this phenomenon. <coughs> One of them is you know, local governments, local officials, generally speaking, generally speaking they, they could get promoted if they, they develop local economy very well. But, you know, for, for, the, for their uh, political performance, uh, for GDP growth, uh, you know, big energy projects is, you know, very, very important, you know, pusher. Uh, but the energy conservation, you know, we could understand is a, is a kind of very important resources, but it's not so uh, 
induce uh, not so uh, you know uh, it's not rewarded uh, attractive yeah. to the to the local governments. And we could see that the government funding for <coughs> energy conservation is not only scarce and st unstable, but also scattered among various departments. You know, you know, the energy, co energy uh, investment from the government is limited and unstable. In particular, you could see that uh, after the law came into effect in, two, in, in 1990, uh, on the January 1st, 1998, you know, there, there was the Asia financial crisis. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the, um, pro the productivity level, you know, decreased in many, many Asian areas, including China. So the energy supply, you know, how to say, uh, exceeded the energy demand. demand at that time. So there was no strong incentive for the enterprises, for the governments to promote the energy conservation and energy efficiency. Um, at, at the same time, this limited and unstable government funding is scattered, uh, was scattered among different government agencies. I have just mentioned the, you know, there, are, there were so many government agencies that, you know, uh, got, that were, you know, working in this energy conservation field. The Planning Commission, the Economic and Trade Commission, the Ministry of Construction, the Ministry of, you know, uh, Transportation. The Ministry <laughs> of Agri Agriculture, <laughs> so, 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 you know, different departments, you know, you know, had their different programs for energy conservation. It's, it was very diff difficult to coordinate it. And we could also see another important uh, obstacles for the poor enforcement of the and it's conservation law. That's the offsetting effect of related policies. You know, we could see that under the planned economy system, there was a very, you know, obvious model, economic phenomena. High-priced product, low-priced natural resources, no-priced natural environment. So this, <coughs> this economic pattern created under the planned economy has not you know be changed fundamentally even today so today we also we still suffer this you know this for the for our environmental you know problems we could see that except for this this uh, uh, general pattern economic pattern, we could see that, <coughs> generally speaking, in China, the energy prices are determined or are strictly, uh, you know, uh, regulated by the government. Generally speaking, the energy prices in China are very <coughs> low. It's, it's not a market-based, you know, price, pricing system. But you know, today, you know, the Chinese government is 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 pushing the market uh, oriented mechanism in the field, even in the field of energy. So we could see this as a low energy prices, few to reflect the scarcity of the energy resources, the environment costs, and the costs related to public safety and public health. So that's one of the underlying reasons <coughs> why we suffer so, you know, um, poor enforcement of the energy conservation law. Let's try to move through these so we can get to the new law. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And this one is, last one is the weak technological support for this energy conservation law. The law itself cannot 
cannot work. It 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 has to rely on the techno te technology and the government administration. So in China, we could see that generally speaking, the energy technology level is low. <coughs> it's lower than in most advanced countries. In particular, than the uh, you know energy conservation technology in Japan, mm -hmm. and even in the, and uh, in Japan, and also you know other developed countries, Europe and the U.S. and so on. And the research and development institutions and the intermediary agencies for the energy technology are few. Indigenous innovation capacity is scarce. This, you know, how to, how to, how to understand this. You can see that the in Chinese indigenous innovation capacity for the energy technology is not strong. There are, there are few, you know, strong research and development institutions. So many, many uh, technology, energy, um, consuming, uh, uh, energy conservation technology should be <coughs> imported from other countries. And another problem is the, the current energy conservation standard system are unable to stimulate, to encourage the technological innovation and the development because most of the existing energy conservation standards are excessively tied to the current average technological level rather than the current advanced technology level. So we could see that the, the current energy conservation standard is easy, very easy to meet. So there is no encouragement, no you know, uh, strong, uh, if, how to say, strong encouragement, yeah. promotion for enterprises to develop, you know, uh, more advanced, you know, uh, energy conservation technologies to use these energy conservation technologies. Yes, so I have just mentioned the main obstacles that you know, the energy conservation law is facing in its enforcement process. So currently, uh, uh, now let's come to the, 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 the new amendments for this energy conservation law. I have just mentioned that this new amend, amended energy conservation law is, is a little bigger than the original one. Bigger is better, okay. <laughs> because the original one is, you know, uh, for the original man, there 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 were uh, yes there are six chapters and fifty articles, but you know for this amended man, there are seven chapters and eighty seven articles. And for this amended law, a new chapter, chapter five, incentive measures, economic market based economic in incentive measures has been included. So, uh, how to say, it's much more uh, specific than the original one. Um, uh, you know, there's some progress. But, you know, we can easily understand that even with this amendment of this legislation itself, <coughs> many obstacles, you know, underlying obstacles uh, uh, you know, defects of this law, of this enforcement mechanism and so on, have not been dealt with very well. So we still face some original challenges, and also, you know, there are some new challenges. So that's the reason why we should, you know, uh, you know uh, go on with our research. Uh, and uh, how to say it. We, we, we should <laughs> you, you will still be employed. Yes, thanks. It's a full employment kind of area of work in China, environmental law. So we, we still have some, some, uh, something to, uh, to research in this field. Yeah, so now let's come to uh, some main points of the amendments. The first, first uh, point is in Chapter 1, General Provisions, uh, the, the new law has uh, clarified the priority 
on the energy conservation. This is different from the original one, from the original one. This law, this amended law declares that energy conservation is a basic national policy of China. <coughs> the state implements an energy development strategy for giving consideration to conservation and development simultaneously and placing top priority on conservation. So this means that for the Chinese government and the, the, the Chinese enterprises and also Chinese citizens, the first priority is energy conservation rather than energy development, energy exploitation. So from the supply side to the demand side. So I think it's a good trans, you know, uh, you know, uh, trans, uh, transfer. Another one, in Article 4, this amended law declares that energy conservation is a basic national policy. Oh, yeah. Repeat, I think sorry. this is repeat. Yeah, sorry about that. Oh. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Made it, <laughs> That's made another it. one. <laughs> this is, no problem. <laughs> this law requires that annual reporting to the state government of energy conservation work. Uh, oh, let me here. see. Requires. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So th uh, this. No, 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 no. Oh, well. Sorry. There, there is a difference. <laughs> there is a difference. This, this law requires that the state council and the people's governments at and above the county level should report energy conservation work to the People's Congress or the Standing Committee thereof at the corresponding levels every year. In other words, not this one, this one is, you know, there is a mistake. It's okay, no. sorry about that. Yes, so the, uh, this law requires that the local governments at the county level, uh, at the district level, county level, and the provincial level, and also the national uh, administration, the state council, they should report their energy conservation work to the uh, you know, standing committee of the National People's Congress or the National People's Congress every year. So that means it's the legal obligation for the, gov for the administrative government to report their energy conservation performance to the legislators. So this is a big progress. So generally speaking, in China, you can, you know, seldom could you see that the, the government should, you know, uh, yes, the government should report, but seldom could you see the law in some, you know, uh, specific laws such as mm -hmm. energy law, energy conservation law requires the government to report, mm -hmm. to see, to, uh, how to say, to, uh, Accept the the uh, the check and balance from the uh, lawmakers. So this and this uh, article article five. six that was article, article five and article six. Mm, yes, uh, it's different. You know, article five requires that the government, the administrative government, should re report to the lawmakers. And the Article 6 requires that the provincial level government should report to the state council. The provincial level administrative agencies should report to the state council, to the, the highest uh, administration in China. So you could see that, the, you know, the China is not a federal system country. It's a centralized you know, administrati administrative country. You know, I have just mentioned, generally speaking, local, you know, high, lower level officials could get promoted if they could, you know, uh, get, you know, uh, good political performance, mm -hmm. such as, you know, big GDP number and so on. Um, so the, 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 the higher level government has very strong control power to the local, to the lower level governments. So this law 
clearly requires the provincial level government must report to the state council every year. If the governor, the provincial level governor, cannot finish its work for the energy conservation, sorry, you will lose your office. So this is a very, very, you know, big, how to say, pressure for the governors in China. But, and also should note, the timing is interesting too, because just about a year ago, the government gave up their whole green GDP idea. And the, that failed. That, that failed, <laughs> miserably. <laughs> But, you know, because of the, the high, you know, so how decentralized the country is. So this is really important, you guys, the idea that this is another angle, and it probably would be a lot easier for them to monitor because it's much more specific and narrow than that broader green GDP concept that was just too complex. So important concept. You will be tested on that point later, so just mm -hmm. keep in mind. Yes. Article 10 uh, of this law clarifies that it's the Energy Conservation Department of the State Council that is responsible for the energy conservation. Other related government agencies, such as the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Construction, and so on, they should, you know, according to this law, they should, you know, uh, carry out their own business for energy conservation. At the same time, they should be responsible for the, you know, energy conservation department of the city council. Currently, it's the National <coughs> Development and Reform Commission. No, and, uh, no, no energy ministry is being formed, no, right? No, no, too bad. Yeah, okay. It, you know, under the National Development and Reform Commission, mm -hmm. there is a section for resource uh, conservation and environmental protection. This, this section for energy conservation, uh, resource pro protection and, and, and environmental protection is, is responsible for the enforcement of this law. Other government agencies, such as the Ministry of, of uh, Agriculture, Ministry of Transportation, Ministry of Construction and so on, yes, they should, you know, within their own, you know, scopes, their business uh, 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 fields, they, they, they should be responsible for this enforcement of any conservation law. But at the same time, they should be responsible to this National oh, Development and Reform mm -hmm. Commission. So that's the, the, there's the, a clear the last one. There's a clear leader now. Yes, that's, that's, that's the last one who should be responsible. Mm -hmm. so, so I think this is important to make it clear, uh, you know, the, the National Development and Reform Commission currently should be responsible. For the on the whole, but you know we don't know if the Ministry of en Energy should be established in the coming future. If this Ministry of Energy could be established, I'm I'm sure I'm sure that this energy conservation laws enforcement should be transferred to this new ministry. But currently, it's the National Development and Reform Commission. I, I hear that there's probably not going to be a Ministry of Energy anytime soon. Who knows? <laughs> Sources have told me. <laughs> and uh, uh, chapter three, the rational use of energy, con uh, energy and energy conservation, expands the coverage to include not only the industrial energy conservation, but, al uh, uh, but also construction, transportation, and uh, uh, field. Not to cover not only the, 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 the energy conservation in the private sector, but also energy conservation by the public institutions, such as you know, the government mm -hmm. uh, units and the universities and so on. Mm -hmm. you know, in China, most of the universities, not, not only most, almost all the universities are public uh, you know, uh, universities rather than private ones. And yeah. Isn't Tsinghua supposed to be really energy efficient, though? No. No. <laughs> I thought I heard that there was talk. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I put you on the spot there. But, uh, you know, it's, it's drawing the energy, f energy te uh, technology field. Yeah. So we are, we are working very hard to improve our energy, you know, policy and laws. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to like... <laughs> and, uh, um, yes. That next slide. Yeah, next slide. Chapter five. Uh, chapter five, I just mentioned, a new chapter, <coughs> the market-based instruments has been 
as uh, you know included in the amendment amendment amended uh, energy conservation law. Uh, according to this chapter, the uh, special energy conservation funds uh, should be established by both central government and the provincial level government. So we could see that in China, according to this law, there should be two level uh, energy conservation fund system. The national energy conservation fund established by the state council and the local energy conservation fund established by the provincial level, you know, uh, government. Mm -hmm. You know, in China we have 26 provinces, you know, five autonomous regions and four municipalities under the central government. And uh, also, you know, uh, um, tax and financial subsidy policies for energy conservation technologies pr pr products has been set up. And uh, the government uh, uh, procurement policies for the energy conservation products and technologies, and the preferential laws for energy conservation technologies and products, and also pricing policies for energy conservation. So this kind of market based instruments has uh, have been introduced into this new law. So you know we could see that these provisions are very general, very very uh, pretty simple. But you know. The city council, or the national development and reform commission, or the construction, a ministry of construction, ministry of uh, ag uh, agriculture, ministry of uh, tra uh, transportation, and uh, and uh, the 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 bureau for you know tax and so on so on. They should you know uh, uh, they should you know uh, make make and implement you know more detailed you know re regulations and rules for these prov provisions. So now, now let's come to the... Actually, you know, I, I had a thought. This guy's been talking a lot. Okay. How about this? Why do we, is how do you guys feel? Why don't we open up and have some questions and discussion on the entropy conservation law? Absolutely. We could, and then we he can go, on go into the... What do you think? Okay. You all, I, I want to make sure you guys are uh, with the program and then so you can remember it, because this was a lot of information. And I know I have a lot of questions, too. So I'd like to open up the floor. Monty, grab your microphone over there, the, um, my research intern. And um, I have a mic to hand out. Is, is Jack and, and Lyndon. But I'll hand it to Tom first. And if you could say your name and affiliation. I'm uh, Tom Friedman from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just a kind of simple question, because you alluded to this, the absence of um, kind of consumer involvement and citizen involvement mm -hmm. in this. Um, can China go green without going orange? Um, uh, uh, no, there was um, some of the, the orange revolution in Ukraine, okay? Uh, orange as a symbol of uh, public civil society empowerment in reinforcing, monitoring, and uh, challenging, basically, uh, environmental laws and environmental producers. That is, to what extent can all these reforms you've talked about, mm -hmm. okay, now we don't have green GDP, now we have a rule that mm -hmm. goes here and then mm -hmm. it's looked at there, uh, but to what extent can any of this work without the Sierra Club, without civil society? Oh, so, you know, how to say, uh, thanks for your question. Actually, you know, um, I, I have just mentioned that China is, is, is in its transition, not only from the planned economy to market oriented economy from the uh, you know traditional state of with rule of man to the modern state of rule of law. Also you could see that you know the civil society is developing in China and in the in particular in the energy in the energy and environment of, in the environment protection fields there are many, many very active, you know, grass rooted uh, you know NGOs. And uh, you know and for the local, for the ordinary uh, people, for the ordinary citizens, their awareness for environmental protection, uh, you know, is still, uh, <coughs> I think, it's still weak, but it's increasing very, very quickly, very fast. So I'm sure that you know, uh, in the in the field of environmental pr protection and energy conservation, the the, you know, not only the the government, but also the uh, the not only the government, but uh, and enterprises, but also the the ordinary people, the environmental NGOs, you know, should and could 
play more important roles. I mean, just if I could do a quick follow-up, it just seemed that um, looking at it from afar, that sorry, the looking at it from afar, that there was so much momentum in terms of uh, GDPism. Mm -hmm. as opposed to green GDPism, mm -hmm. that there was so much m momentum in the system mm -hmm. for just relentless GDPism mm -hmm. that when they changed the rules and said, okay, now we're going to do green GDPism, mm -hmm. it, it, it couldn't take. There was just mm -hmm. way too much economic and political mm -hmm. momentum. Mm -hmm. And when I um, read, like, the NRDC does a um, weekly compilation of the Chinese press on environmental issues, mm -hmm. I'm amazed. Mm -hmm. at how many articles there are now, mm -hmm. uh, exposing environmental polluters um, uh, and, and uh, court cases, mm -hmm. uh, legal challenges. And it almost seems like there was a conscious or unconscious decision uh, at somewhere at the leadership level mm -hmm. to say, uh, you know, we, the only way we can actually turn this ship around mm -hmm. is by empowering civil society, that, that just keeping passing rules and regulations in this to this engine that's so dedicated to GDPism um, isn't isn't working, and I just wonder to what extent that's my imagination or I can say a few things because um, I do a lot of uh, many of you in the room know that that the China Environment Forum we, we work with a lot of the, the NGOs both the international and domestic just real quickly I mean internationally there are about 50 NGOs international NGOs in China a lot of them do energy. But notably, most of them are working on, you know, they started working on the policy sphere, working mm -hmm. with the central government. They helped shape. They were also mm -hmm. probably involved, they were involved in a lot of these laws. Energy Foundation puts more money into energy efficiency projects and research in China than the Department of Energy does, right? You know, so I mean, it's, so that, you know, the non-governmental community in the U.S. has been highly involved, NRDC, Environmental Defense. Um, now, there, there is actually, there aren't very many, though, domestic Chinese NGOs that do energy. A lot of them NGOs in China tend to be more the environmental education. Not saying that they're not pushing the envelope. And we had the anti-dam campaign on the New Zhang a couple of years ago. I mean, there's the South North Institute for Sustainable Development, which, which, which is more technical. But they work with NRDC. They've, they've helped shape policy. I'm sure you know some of those folks, too. Um, but, then, but then in terms of transparency, you know, the first step you know, in seeing a Chinese NGO moving towards energy is Ma Jun just opened up um, his Institute for Environment and Public Affairs. Just He had a water pollution database that went online last year and now just recently an air pollution database. Now, moment, at the moment, he's just using government sources mm -hmm. for this. But this is an important step, the idea, the concept that a Chinese NGO is mm -hmm. going to be promoting transparency on a highly sensitive issue. So I think that it's, the energy sphere is tougher because it's, it, it puts the NGOs, you know, if you're, if you're talking about grassroots stuff, is, you know, at odds with local governments. You know, the only NGOs in China who've been, activists who've been arrested, there have been two, and they were doing anti-pollution activities. You know, so that's not bad, only two being arrested. But I think that, that we're, we're, the fact that shouldn't be noted, though, is that, that international NGOs have been very active and very influential in the energy sphere in China. So I think that that's, it's a different kind of civil society, but a lot of, International NGOs have ostensibly become indigenous, WWF. And I'll stop there because I could rattle on all day on this. And you guys paid to come in with walking in on ice today to ask your questions. Thank you very much for your comments. Okay. Good morning. Thank you very much for that informative uh, presentation on the law. My name is uh, John Habian, and I work on the China desk at the State Department. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the, the um, kind of implementation and uh, enforcement of this law. I mean, you, you mentioned some incentives that are, that are in the law. Um, but, you know, as we know, the NDRC, as compared to, say, the Department of Energy or, you know, other kind of Western institutions, is quite, seems quite under-resourced, both in terms of people and, uh, you know, financial measures. Um, so I was wondering exactly how this might work. Are, are, are more resources going to be devoted to the NDRC uh, resource protection Bureau, are, are they going to have re recourse to uh, the courts mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to enforce this law with provincial governors and authorities? Or how, how, how do you envision the kind of implementation and enforcement of this, of this mm -hmm. law? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, you know, I have mentioned that, mm -hmm. you know, for the uh, current uh, 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 and, and conservation law, the, the enforcement is poor, generally speaking. But uh, the, you know, the central government uh, and 
you know the Chinese government, in particular the central government, has uh, really, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, clearly re realized the challenges of energy cons conservation. So it, it uh, you know, uh, uh, you could say that the. Uh, the, the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress, you know, has amended uh, this uh, energy conservation. At the same time, could say that the State Council has, uh, uh, you know, uh, made some decisions to strengthen the energy conservation. Uh, and uh, I have just mentioned, you know, uh, you know, uh, um, um, this law, this amended law, will come into force in the in the coming uh, uh, April. But I'm sure that you know. Uh, you know there there are you know many there are already many efforts uh, to uh, strengthen the the resources, including the f funding and uh, the the uh, inf enforcement uh, you know force and uh, uh, and the the economic inf incentive uh, measures uh, and so on. So. Uh, at the national level and also at the local levels, um, uh, but you know uh, uh, how to say I have mentioned that you know the the eleventh five year plan has uh, clearly uh, required uh, required that the the energy uh, consumption per GDP should uh, uh, decline dec decline twenty percent uh, uh, you know uh, before two thousand and ten uh, so. We could see that uh, uh, also uh, at the, the the national level. Hopefully, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully, you know the you know uh, the Ministry of Energy could be established. But, mm -hmm. You know, you, you have just mentioned that, or that it's no, not no possible. No maybe possible not in the, not March. But I think SEPA is going to be moved up. But every the word to the grapevine that I've heard, and I think some people in the room would agree. We have we've heard that the Ministry of Energy it won't be next month. Oh, really? Well, but I'm sorry. <laughs> well, well, hopefully I'm but, wrong. But, but rumors you know, can be wrong. But, uh, my understanding, and and you know, my uh, how to say, uh, from my understanding that you know, uh, uh, from my my understanding, you know, uh, it's 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 very hopeful to es <coughs> to establish this new Ministry of Energy. Okay. At the okay. same time, the, the okay. Ministry of uh, Environment Protection should be should be you know. Uh, um, in, should be you know established to s replace the the state environment, environmental protection administration. Um, so, um, just, uh, how to say? I, I'm op optimistic about this this uh, improved enforcement for the amended law. But you know, we 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 need time to to see what will happen. One thing I want to interject is that actually something that before this, this, the new amendments passed, about three years ago, I had a group of, from the Beijing Development and Reform Commission come through. The DOE brought them in. And they were very, I mean, they, they struck me as almost frantic because they said, we need to create, we need to make our city more energy efficient. And this was kind of being pushed by the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And that they were here to try to find partners and get help on doing the whole government procurement. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, do you know about in Beijing in particular, my, my impression has been that, that is that government procurement for energy mm -hmm. efficient products yes. and that that's actually moved forward. Yes, is that yes. true? Actually it's, it's included into the law. The amended no, but but the Beijing has actually started doing that a few years ago. I mean that the yeah. Yes, that's true. But anyway, so even preceding the law then somebody's and but that the fact that it's worked, you know we have a you know a law on public uh, government uh, procurement. Yes. So before this even. Yes. So we have another law. A law for Government procurement, uh, uh, procurement. So this 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 government pro, uh, procurement law requires that the government should should buy the energy conservation uh, products. Yeah. So so we have you know not only this energy conservation law but also that. And if they don't procure it, that that also could mean a loss in jobs. No, not. I mean, where's the stick? Not, not where's the stick? That's what I'm kind of wondering on not that. Not so not so many lawsuits. For this, but you know, I'm sure that uh, I, I know that uh, you know the government is is pushing forward this kind of okay. work. Yes, that's okay. Okay, and sir. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Jaffe. I represent the National Wildlife Federation. Mm -hmm. uh, we're a U.S. environmental group, and while we don't have uh, actual 
facilities in China. We have uh, four million members across the United States wow. and Impressive. all the states. And we lobby the U.S. Congress and the administration to try to improve U.S. international policy. And I, I was struck in your presentation, uh, while there are significant differences, of course, between China and the United States, uh, about one very important uh, similarity, and that is that we have a planned economy when it comes to energy. <laughs> it, it's planned to promote fossil energy. <laughs> and the prices that are experienced by the economy and the population and the consumers have nothing to do with the reality uh, of what the co actual costs are. Mm -hmm. And we are struggling. In fact, uh, there is no price at all on carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. uh, except now the states are beginning to okay, take yeah. initiatives, uh, as you know. Um, and uh, we are struggling to... Uh, uh, change our planned economy into a, a market uh, where uh, the uh, prices actually reflect uh, the costs. Um, and uh, uh, I worked for the U.S. Congress uh, for some years, and I work lobbying it now uh, to try to get them to understand uh, the Chinese economy and uh, law and so on. And uh, we're in this uh, problem, this dilemma, where the United States, uh, many in the United States say China must <laughs> act first on global warming, and China says the United States must act first, and we actually feel that it does have a responsibility to move first, but everybody has to eventually uh, move. So my question to you is, um, and I, I, I appreciate that you've been working with my colleagues from other environmental groups mm -hmm. here probably in the room, mm -hmm. uh, it, I think it's very important uh, that civil society um, exchange information about uh, the progress that is being made. Mm -hmm. uh, we found at the Bali uh, conference that many around the world mm -hmm. didn't realize that uh, Congress is moving on uh, global warming policy, and of course people in the United States don't understand the progress uh, that is being made in China. So my question is um, whether you uh, believe there are opportunities uh, for us to get information from people like you about the progress that's being made uh, on a systematic basis. In other words, uh, there should be um, publications that uh, systematically uh, mm -hmm. every few months mm -hmm. uh, tell what progress has been made mm -hmm. and uh, on the points that, uh, that you've raised. And I would just be interested in your uh, comments about uh, whether that kind of um, uh, exchange is possible and now and uh, perhaps in the future, mm -hmm. there'll be more opportunities for us to uh, talk about that. Okay, okay, great. So, I, so I, I, I think that you know, yes, we could we could do that, no problem. Yes, um, actually, you know, uh, currently I'm 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 writing a paper on the uh, on the energy and the and the climate change uh, in China, uh, which will be published in a journal. Uh, so, except for these ac academic, you know, research uh, publications, there are many uh, government publications, official publications. So we could, uh, you know, get uh, these kind of publications from different ways on the website or even uh, go to the government. China speaking, we get we could get m most of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, information, uh, you know, on the website. So if if you are interested, we could, you know. Uh, uh, organize. We could collect, uh, you know, organize, and you know, um, you know, provide you this kind of Thank information. You. That would be okay. very valuable. Great. But there are also, I mean, if you go to our website, and you know, we're, we've been reorganizing it, but that um, that there are actually a lot of news. That there, not as many. Some have kind of died off, but there are newsletters out there, and you can, and any of you here, you can always email me, and I can help you find. Mm -hmm. There's a news, you know, regular newsletter that gives out news announcement. The Chinese embassy sends out some S and T you know, 
progress. So, you know, there's, but it's true, there's a lot of difficulty in sometimes distilling it. So, you know, we try to be an information clearinghouse on that topic, too. Yes. Right there, sir. Uh, I'm Jerry Peterson. I'm with the Department of State and the University of Colorado. It's a oh, partnership yeah. arrangement. In this country, a lot of the enthusiasm for energy policy changes to meet environmental needs has come from students. Mm -hmm. To what extent have and our universities and colleges developed degree programs and courses to meet this? Mm -hmm. To what extent is this happening in China, particularly at a leading institution such as Tsinghua? Are there degrees, courses for the students to j train the next generation? Oh, yes, thanks. Great. So, <laughs> Was that question planted in the audience? Yes, good. Yes, go. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, I would like to <coughs> answer your question in, in you know simple words. So not only to you, but also to this gentleman. Actually, you know, uh, I have just uh, uh, forgot <laughs> uh, to introduce my research center. My research center is uh, you know uh, is, is called uh, Center for Environmental, Natural Resources, and Energy Law of Tsinghua University. Uh, you know, maybe you know that Tsinghua University is one of the uh, you know. Uh, leading university in China in the field of science and technology, in particular, uh, you know, uh, uh, energy technology. Uh, you know, Tsinghua University is strong in the field of thermal technologies, uh, hydropower and water resources technologies, and nuclear technologies, and so on. So we have a small, uh, you know, nuclear reactor at Tsinghua. <laughs> so, um, you know, now research center is a university level research uh, in the center is an uh, interfective inter research, interdisciplinary research center. Uh, so, you know, uh, now research members come from the School of Law, School of Public Policy, School of Social Sciences, Department of Environmental Science, Department, uh, Department of uh, uh, Thermal uh, uh, Engineering, and uh, uh, Department of Nuclear. Uh, technologies and and uh, and so on, and uh, um, uh, at, uh, you know we work we work out we, we not only give the courses to the students, uh, we also you know conduct research. We uh, advise the government. Uh, you know, Jennifer has just mentioned we work with the National People's Congress, mm -hmm. uh, Environmental Protection Commission. We work with uh, the national uh, the Environmental Protection uh, State Environmental Protection. Administration, the Chinese EPA, and also we work with the Beijing Municipal Government. You know, I'm the the legal advisor for the Beijing Municipal Government, even in particular for the Olympic Game, environmental issues, and uh, um, and we also work with uh, work with many international colleagues, such as Energy Conservation. Oh, sorry, uh, Energy Foundation in China, uh, Natural Resources Council in mm -hmm. China, uh, and and so on. Uh, so currently, you know, three of our students uh, are, are interning here at the DC office of, of NRDC. They're in the room somewhere. So. <laughs> yes, <coughs> three of They're our there. students here. So in the, in, the, in, the, in the future, you know, every year, two, of, two or three of my students will come to, to intern at the DC office of NRDC. Uh, and uh, uh, so these students are very, very, you know, uh, talented, uh, talented uh, very, very, you know, uh, they work very hard, uh, they're very smart. And, uh, you know, at Tsinghua, you know, Tsinghua is a leading university in the field of uh, environmental and energy law. So we, we give the, uh, you know, in China, legal system is different from, from the legal system in states. We have, you know, undergraduate law program, we have, under, uh, we have undergraduate uh, uh, law program, we have graduate legal uh, uh, program. Uh, I, for the undergraduate uh, students, at a law school, we we give uh, we currently we offer two courses. One is international environmental law, uh, which is given in English, uh, and another one is uh, the environmental protection law, uh, which is given in Chinese. Um, uh, for the master degree students, we we uh, you know we have uh, environmental and protection and energy law program of a master degree program for environmental natural resources and energy law. Uh, so now our students are here. So uh, we, we, we offer five courses for the master degree students. Environmental law, international environmental law, comparative environmental law, including the US environmental law, and Europe, and, uh, and the Japanese, and so on. And the, the fourth one is natural resources law, and the another, another one, last one is energy law. Uh, so uh, we, we, you know, we offer these courses, and we, we uh, you know, uh, train these students to be the you know, uh, not only the uh, 
academic uh, leaders in the field of environmental natural resources and energy law, but also you know they they are, uh, we hope that they could be uh, uh, you know leading pr practitioners in this field to help the polluters to uh, to help the policy makers even lawmakers. So we so we we are very uh, you know uh, how to say pride to be you know one of these uh, leaders. Uh, Leaders in this field, we are. We, we also, you know, uh, we would very like, very much like to work with our international colleagues. I mean, there are also. I mean, I mean, there's. You guys specialize a lot in the in the energy and the law and the environment, but mm -hmm. but well, no. I mean, your center. Yes. But that. But you have Renmin University, People's University, that the you know, Ma Zhong created. And he's an environmental. He's an environmental economist. Yeah. You know he, that they've got that specialty. Bay, Beijing University is a little bit more broader, has urban planning component. Nanjing University also diverse as well. So I mean, it's it's it's, a, it's, a, it's an intriguing trend when you're looking at the universities. And I think that one thing though that I'm interested in though is seeing more. You know, I see a lot of um, international organizations going to Tsinghua and Beijing University, but what I don't see as much as is the international organizations going to some of the more you know getting out of Beijing. You know, no offense, but you get a lot of people. But you know, I think that that that's also an area that's going to need work eventually is building the capacity. Of environmental policy centers outside of Beijing. No problem. No, so, you get so it. So welcome to Beijing. Welcome to well, Beijing. To, you know, so Beijing uh, University of Tsinghua University because I, I I graduated from Beijing University. Okay. <laughs> okay. And also, you know, welcome to other universities. Or you know. After you check them uh, yes, out first. Uh, you know. Okay. Uh, out of Marcia, Beijing. Yeah, we got her right here. Marcia, yeah. yeah I, I... Into the mic, if you don't mind, because we're webcasting. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to take a quick moment to add to this. Uh, Professor Wong escorted me to several provincial universities <laughs> to talk about U.S. environmental law mm -hmm. three years ago or so. And I was astounded by the number of students enrolled in environmental law programs. So these were largely undergraduates at places like Jilin yes. and, you know, several other places that we were lucky enough to go. And their enthusiasm and their passion and their advocacy skills. The first question was always to me about the United States policy on yeah. Kyoto Protocol, <laughs> <laughs> of which I am no expert and did not purport to speak. But uh, you can understand the sense of, of energy and uh, willingness to speak up and mix it up. And I was really excited by that aspect. And uh, an opportunity to publicly thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then we had. Oh, she had the mic. Okay, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, hello, thank you for the really great presentation. Um, it's been very interesting. My name is Manisha Shah. I'm with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, mm -hmm. and we've been working in China for about 10 years with the EPA um, Inter Integrated Environmental Strategies Program mm -hmm. with uh, some of your colleagues at Tsinghua University. Mm -hmm. So I had two questions, and feel free to answer one or both, whatever you have time for and you remember. Okay. Um, but the first question was, um, you know, I apologize if you've already covered this aspect, but how does this environmental or energy conservation law interact with the, the five-year plan targets which are in place for energy intensity? You know, we, you alluded a little bit to the fact that sometimes the performance goals for local uh, of officials is oftentimes incentivized by these, you know, the targets, but how does that interact with the uh, energy conservation law? Mm -hmm. That's the first question. The second question was also, can you talk a little bit about the story of how the incentive measures were included in this um, version of the environmental conservation or energy conservation law? You know, was that fueled by the business community? Was there, was there a lot of um, interaction with NGOs that kind of got this piece of the uh, energy conservation law included, um, which was not Initially included. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Mm, thank you. I actually, you know, I have just uh, just mentioned that you know the original uh, energy conservation law, um, how to say, is, is uh, doesn't work so well. You know, there are different you know uh, reasons for this uh, failure. Uh, you know, I have just mentioned some defects uh, of the legislation itself and also some de uh, you know, underlying defects of the, uh, you know, uh, barriers, underlying barriers of the enforcement and so on. Um, but, um, but generally speaking, you know, uh, uh, one of the, uh, the basic uh, underlying element is the market-based instrument, uh, uh, you know, has not been introduced in this, uh, you know, or, or original law. So for the, uh, so we could see that 
uh, on, on one side, the, the law requires the government should take the responsibility to strengthen the energy conservation, but the problem is, is uh, you know, many uh, local governments don't work well, uh, work actively to, to, how to say, to implement their own obligation. So we could see that, uh, you know, in the amended energy conservation law, the law clearly requires the, the, the government to report to the lawmakers to, how to say, to check the balance there. Uh, so that, you know, uh, it's, uh, it, it's uh, you know, it's helpful to, you know, to uh, uh, promote the uh, enforcement, uh, the, the uh, implementation of the energy conservation, the, the amended energy conservation law. So that, you know, because we generally, how to say, uh, si si simply, um, in simple words, we could say that the law requires the, the local government should, and the, the state council should take their legal responsibility to uh, promote the energy conservation. And uh, uh, also, the state, uh, uh, within the administrative system, you know, the law, the amended law, clear, clearly requires that the, the provincial level uh, government must report their their performance and its conservation performance to the state council. I have just mentioned that if the if the governors of the some you know provinces, uh, autonomous regions, and uh, uh, municipalities under the uh, uh, state council cannot finish their targets, they will lose their office. So we could see that you know the this this is very helpful to how to say to deal with the, the failure of the uh, uh, say the government failure to implement their legal obligation. But but it but it also will in terms of the eleventh five year plan it also I mean the, yeah, the five year that's, that's yeah the five year plan problem. is just more it's a target but doesn't necessarily necessarily it's tell you how to do it. Uh, yes, it's a target, but the law <coughs> has, you know, uh, clarifies some, you know, mechanisms and teeth for that target. So they, they, they work together. It's a whole system. And how about now the backstory on the with the incentive measures being put into the law? Was there a lot of because you and this is maybe kind of what I alluded to in my intro introductory remarks is that there were academics like you yes. and NGOs. Do you, do you have any interesting anecdotes that you um, can reveal? about how, w did you guys play a role in getting those incentives oh, put in? Uh, I don't have much, ma many stories <laughs> on this, but uh, I, I know that, you know, for, for this inclusion of these market-based <coughs> incentives measures, you know, they are, you know, how to say, uh, the balance between different, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders, uh, in particular for the, you know, you know the law has strengthened the, the, the legal obligation of the local governments, but, for the enterprises, for the enterprises, how to strengthen the attractive needs, how to, how to, how to incentive them, how to encourage them. So that's a big question, that's a big problem. You know, so the government, <laughs> when the government, you know, uh, strengthen the energy conservation uh, work, they could use the standard quotas and, uh, and so on, uh, other you know, command and control measures. But these measures, generally speaking, cannot work alone. So they need, you know, the market is the carrot, you know, how to stick in the carrot. So the government needs this, you know. It, you know, the government has its stick in his hand, according to this, but it needs, the government needs carrot. For the enterprises, yes, with the stick on his head, on their heads. So, they know they have to have to do this time. There's no other choice, because this, you know, different situation. This amended law must be enforced strictly. So they have no other choice. So they need carrot. So from the enterprises side, they need this. For the academics, you could see that, you know, some NGOs, some. I, even international NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have the opportunity to get in, involved in the law uh, revision process. Because it was open to yeah, public yes, comment yes, in yes, December. Yes, you know, so, uh, Barbara Finnemore has given a lot of, you know, 
good suggestions for this, you know, this kind of okay, law. Barbara Finnemore <laughs> the, heads the energy work on the NRDC in China. Yes, and other Chinese uh, uh, scholars, you know, they are very active to promote, you know, you know, so, you know I, I don't know if the scholars in the States, you know, take part in this kind of, you know, lawmaking and law, law revision process, but in China, some, some scholars, you know, really, you know, take part in this. I myself have taken part in the, the, the drafting, the research and the drafting of several laws, including the uh, renewable energy law and other laws, yes. Okay, got some other questions? Yeah. Where, Marty, where's the mic? Monty, where's the mic? Okay, she's got them. Hi, uh, Dr. Wong, thank you so much for your informative presentation. Um, my name is Louisa Chan, and I am from the Select uh, U.S. House of Representatives mm -hmm. Select Committee on Global Warming, mm -hmm. um, as well as the Atlantic Council of the United States. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to ask you a question because you touched on this topic briefly in your the beginning of your presentation, um, and mentioned that China is a number two mm -hmm. uh, emitter of greenhouse gases. So I was wondering, um, how does the new amendments into the energy conservation <laughs> law um, reflect those concerns from you know the Chinese and international community mm -hmm. and how will they address those problems? Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. <laughs> it's, it's very sensitive and very difficult to answer. <laughs> but you know, I, I've just mentioned you know the amendment of this energy conservation law is uh, I think is is uh, is a very significant for the for the future energy conservation work in China. Uh, you know, you know. I have talked a lot mm -hmm. about the the, the failures uh, of this uh, legislation itself and uh, of the enforcement uh, in mechanism and so on. But I haven't talked talk much about the 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 pressures, you know, from the international community, uh, you know, on China in particular, you know, for climate change. But you could see that you know the energy conservation and the renewable energy development in China. Uh, how to say? Uh, it's it's to, it's not only the need for the domestic development for the you know economic domestic internet economic and social development but also for the international community concerns you know china is the second contributor of greenhouse gases in the in the world at the same time china is one of the biggest victims of climate change of climate change, you you have mentioned the the the, the snowstorm in southern China. You know, you know, s so big, you know, great losses, you know, property losses, and life losses, and so on. So China is generally speaking is a big country with a big population. It's still, a, how to say, agriculture country. Mm -hmm. It's an agriculture country. Uh, uh, how to say it's uh, it's transferred from an uh, agriculture country to an uh, industrial and commercial country, or there are two countries, as some people <laughs> like to say. So, so you could see that you know, climate change is a big concern for not only the international community but also for Chinese government and Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So, this law <coughs> to improve the energy conservation is, I think, is big promote promotion to deal with this. Uh, to how to say to mitigate, to how to say relief mm -hmm. the okay. energy, uh, you know uh, the climate change. Yes. Okay. There's another question out here. Oh, can you talk? An, oh, that was it. Oh, you stole his question. <laughs> Do I have another question or comment? This has never been known for a quiet group out here. Some other questions or comments from. Yes, Bill. Oh, can you take the mic, please? Um, welcome, Professor Wang. Uh, I'm Bill Penham, uh, law firm of Sutherland, Nash, Bill and Brennan. I'm here for the China-U.S. Energy Efficiency Alliance. And I had a question about the new conservation law. It has a number of significant features. Implementation is to begin in April. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense as to what will be the initial steps taken to implement the new law? Um, many of the provisions set important but general guidelines, mm -hmm. so implementation will be important. Do you, do you have a sense, say, for the first year, what kinds of actions may be taken? Um, <clears throat> okay, thank you. Actually, you know, uh, 
this this amended law will come into effect on April first. But uh, according to the eleventh five year plan, and according to the state council's decision to strengthen the energy conservation, there are already many many steps, many many measures that have been taken. Uh, one of the most important step, steps is the state council requires that every province, autonomous region, and municipality under the central government to implement its own implementation plan for, you know, after its approval by the state council, they have to, they must, they have to, you know, finish this, you know, assigned work. <laughs> so they are already very, very strict, uh, uh, stringent measures. But uh, <coughs> how to say, there are many, many difficulties, funding, uh, uh, you know, institutional uh, arrangements, uh, you know, uh, you know quality qualified, uh, you know, personnel, uh, and, and so on and so forth, so technology and so on, yes. But, but would you say, though, that with, with this law, I mean, there's been a lot of, inter for example, you know, I have people coming in and out here all the time g giving talks and writing for me that are doing energy efficient and, and, and energy projects in China. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the energy <laughs> conservation law is, is going to really help that work move forward? I mean, you know, and I think that, you know, there's also opportunities, the strategic economic dialogue, mm -hmm. the U.S.-China discussions that a, part, a component <laughs> of that focuses on energy, and, you know, this, this hypothetically could open up more opportunities for concrete, you know, government-to-government -government action. Stay tuned. So I think I want to end on a positive, you know, unfortunately, we gave this guy a big, oh, is there another, oh, we do have another question. Okay. Uh, I'm Ryan Mulholland from Georgetown University in the Department <laughs> of Commerce. Um, my question is, is kind of simple, but I'm not sure the answer is as simple as the question. Um, how much does China look towards the United States for action on climate change um, as kind of a leader? And if the U.S. were to take more decisive action on climate change, would, would China quickly follow, or would it be a, a more drawn-out process? Mm -hmm. um. Yeah, I think, you know, both, both the states, United States and China are the, you know, you know um, how to say, the most important uh, contributors for climate change. Uh, at the same time, you know, I think I have just mentioned that China is a developing country with big population. Uh, it's one of the biggest victims of climate change. Um, so, so the Chinese government, you know, my understanding is the Chinese government um, position is that, you know, to strengthen the domestic uh, energy conservation, renewable energy, and other, you know, legal, uh, uh, techno te technological, uh, even e economic, and even political process to, to how to, to relief, to mitigate the, uh, you know, climate change. Uh, at the same time, internationally, uh, you know, uh, China, China, Chinese government has just published a national program for climate change, but you know it has it has declared that it would take every <coughs> effort to to how to to uh, face the challenges of climate change, um, uh, to work with the international community, including the United States, uh, to to face this change ch challenge. Um, but um, internationally, in the international legal perspective, the Chinese government has not, and I don't think it will, uh, uh, how to say, uh, accept a very uh, quantified, uh, uh, quanti quantified targets. Mm -hmm. But domestically, and it's, it's working, it's prepared, it's being prepared for this. Um, but a lot of that, and, and what's uh, happening domestically though, a lot of that is motivated by local pollution problems and energy hunger. Yes. 
as opposed to climate change being the main drivers. But I think that's, I really think that still is the case. But also, I, I'm sure that, you know, Chinese government has really clearly, you know, uh, realized that in the, in the coming future, in some time, Chinese government has to take the international obligation mm -hmm. to, you know, reduce, to control, to reduce the climate change. So it has no other choice. So and I know that you know Chinese Chinese government shares us you know some some position with the United States uh, U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So there, there there are a lot of you know uh, you know collaborations in the field of uh, energy climate change, including the the technology field and 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 other. But there could be more. I mean, a lot of it really is driven by our by our NGO community. But yes. Okay. Now you know what I know. I let us start a little late. But I have to end on time because that's part of my social contract with all of you. Wanna, could we applaud this man? Can you believe how much he talked? It was amazing. I mean, in the, and, and no complaints about your content, English oh. skills, all wonderful? Too much time. It's time to end. Yes. Yes. Great. Jay Shula. But you can attack, uh, not attack, you could tackle him gently up here if you have questions about the renewable energy, and we'll just have to have him back sometime. Oh, and, um, March 19th at 12 o'clock, we're screening an environmental film festival film here on, energy, on clean green buildings. Did you? Question. Uh, so the PowerPoints and maybe the PowerPoints. The PowerPoints are online. The thicker PowerPoint is online now. And how about English versions of the two laws? Are they available? the English version of the two laws? Oh yes, you could you could get it very easily. From the we'll, we'll find out where it is and we'll post it because we, we put up summary and we have a little see also 